Is it possible to balance the budget while lifting caps on defense spending? And how should Congress be helping the persecuted Christians of the Middle East? Congresswoman Diane Black, a member of the House Budget Committee, joins us. And later, the Benedictines of Mary have done it again. Another number one release on the Billboard Classical Charts with Easter at Ephesus. What's their secret? Their producer, Monica Fitzgibbons of De Montfort Music, will tell us. And finally, defending religious freedom in the U.S. and abroad. In an exclusive interview, Pastor Rick Warren and Tom Farr of Georgetown University say religious freedom is more than freedom to worship. The World Over Live begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Congresswoman Diane Black, the secret of the phenomenal success of recording artists, the Benedictine Sisters of Mary, and Rick Warren and Tom Farr are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo, or drop me an email. I'm at worldover at EWTN.com. We've got a lot to get to. Here's the brief. News from the world over this week. More trouble in U.S.-Israeli relations. The Obama administration is alleging that Israel spied on closed-door nuclear talks among the U.S., Iran, and other world powers. Current and former senior Obama administration officials told the Wall Street Journal that Israel had penetrated the sensitive talks and used the information to build a case against an emerging agreement. Israel denied the charges on Tuesday, saying they gained their information by other means. Defense Minister Moishe Yalan suggested that someone is attempting to create a dispute and a bad atmosphere between the U.S. and Israel. The Journal reported that the White House knew of the spying but didn't become upset until confidential details were given to Congress. The U.S. discovered the Israeli spy operation while spying on Israel. And public executions by the Islamic State continue in Mosul. On Tuesday, a man and woman were stoned to death on charges of adultery, according to the New York Times. Witnesses say hundreds of residents were gathered to view the executions. Later in the day, three young men were beheaded. They were the nephews of a political opponent of ISIS. Meanwhile, Canada is expanding its military mission against the Islamic State. Prime Minister Stephen Harper announced in Parliament on Tuesday that the Royal Canadian Air Force will begin airstrikes against ISIS positions in Syria. Its mission thus far had been limited to Iraq. The U.S. and Canada are the only NATO nations conducting bombing missions in Syria. They join four other Middle Eastern countries. In a related story, Saudi Arabia has begun airstrikes against Iran-backed Shiite rebels in Yemen for the first time. And the first major party candidate has announced his intention to run for the presidency of the United States. Getting in front of the pack, Republican Senator Ted Cruz made it official this week. The Canadian-born Texan took center stage at the Evangelical Liberty University on Monday. It is a time for truth. It is a time for liberty. It is a time to reclaim the Constitution of the United States. Cruz is among what is expected to be a crowded field of GOP candidates. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul is expected to officially launch his candidacy right after Easter on April 7th. Meanwhile, on the Democratic side, the draft Elizabeth Warren campaign has taken a new turn. On Sunday, the Boston Globe launched its coverage of the 2016 presidential race, devoting three pieces, all arguing for the Massachusetts senator to enter the fray. The editorial said it would be a mistake for Democrats to let Hillary Clinton coast to the presidential nomination without real opposition. Warren has repeatedly said that she is not running. We shall see. 
And a half a millennium later, in England, the winter of his discontent has given way to a glorious spring remembrance and a final rest fit for a king. Thousands this week paid tribute to Richard III, the last Plantagenet king. In 1485, he was struck down in the Battle of Bosworth. The king was later buried without pomp and his remains lost after his tomb was destroyed during the Reformation. Richard's remains were finally unearthed during an archaeological excavation in 2012 under a Leicester parking lot, the site of a former 16th century friary. On Monday, Cardinal Vincent Nichols of Westminster celebrated a requiem mass for the Catholic King. On Thursday, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, presided over the burial ceremony at the Church of England's Leicester Cathedral. And Pope Francis has come out against capital punishment no matter the crime. In prepared remarks given to an anti-death penalty group, Pope Francis said that the death penalty is an offense against the invulnerability of life and the dignity of the human person, which contradicts God's plan for man and society. It does not render justice to the victims, but rather fosters vengeance, end quote. The Pope further argued in opposition to St. Thomas Aquinas that a convict sentenced to death is denied the possibility to repent or make amends, and thus denied an encounter with God's merciful and healing justice. The Holy Father also spoke out against life sentences, since they, quote, deprive detainees not only of their freedom, but also of hope. He characterized life sentences as, quote, a sort of covert death penalty. And the brewing controversy over the appointment of a Chilean bishop accused of a sex abuse cover-up exploded in an angry protest on Saturday. Thousands of faithful dressed in black gathered outside the Asorno Cathedral as others inside attempted to stop the ordination of Bishop Juan Barros. Riot police were called in to protect the bishop, and the mass was cut short after 30 minutes. Bishop Barros has been accused by at least three victims. They claim he was present when they were molested by a father, Fernando Cardima, in the 80s and 90s. One of the accusers, Juan Carlos Cruz, a journalist, said he holds the pope responsible. He told the Associated Press that victims never expected a slap in the face from the pope. Critics suggest that this is a violation of Pope Francis's zero tolerance pledge of abuse by priests. More than a thousand lay faithful and 30 priests from the diocese had petitioned Pope Francis to rescind the appointment. The Vatican investigated and found Father Cardima guilty of sex abuse in 2011. Bishop Barros denies any knowledge of the sexual abuse. And finally, the purported miraculous liquefying blood of a relic in the presence of Pope Francis has stirred some debate. Some insist it's the first time that it's ever happened in the presence of a pope. Others argue it was all staged. In Naples this past Saturday, Pope Francis venerated the relic, two vials of the coagulated blood of St. Gennaro. The blood half liquefied, according to Cardinal Crescencio Sepe, the Archbishop of Naples. He declared it a sign that the patron saint of Naples loves Pope Francis. The Pope appeared to downplay the implied miracle, quipping, it means the saint loves us halfway. The relic of the fourth century saint is said to miraculously liquefy only three times a year. Now, some have mused that this liquefaction was choreographed. Cardinal Seppe can be clearly seen on video shaking the vials of the relic before handing it to Pope Francis, raising speculation that nothing miraculous caused St. Gennaro's blood to liquefy. Climate changes have been credited with causing the blood's liquefaction in the past. When we return, we'll discuss the budget battle and one congressman's plan to help persecuted Christians. Tennessee Congresswoman Diane Black joins us when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there.
president's latest budget would never balance, despite the fact that it's calling for $2 trillion in new taxes. House Republicans believe that we can do better. And that's why this week, the House will vote on a balanced budget for a stronger America. Our plan brings our books to balance in less than 10 years without raising taxes. Welcome back to The World Over Live. That is Congresswoman Diane Black. The budget battle is once again enjoined on Capitol Hill. The comment, to comment on all of this, we're joined by the Congresswoman herself, Diane Black of Tennessee. She's a member of the House Budget and the Powerful Ways and Means Committee. Congresswoman, thank you for joining us. Well, it's so good to be with you tonight. Pleasure to have here. you here. Well, the, the House has passed its budget plan. Now, give people a quick idea here. This is not legally binding. This is just kind of a blueprint, right? That's correct. This is a messaging statement, mm -hmm. uh, and it is a messaging statement to say what it is that we would like to see happen here in this country. Country. Obviously, we're building up debt, and so this is a budget that would balance in less than 10 years, which is something very exciting for us because, you know, as the debt is growing, it doesn't help our children or our grandchildren. Yeah. Um, it does set out a number of our priorities on health care, for instance, repealing Obamacare. Yeah. Uh, it does say that we will reform our very complicated um, tax system, so mm. something fairer, flatter, and simpler, which, again, is economic development, mm. and it helps the American people to see what our vision for our country is. Uh, now, what do you say to the 16.4 million people who are already covered under Obamacare? What happens to them, and what are you going to supplant this with? Yes. Are you going to put something else in place? Well, we tell them that we understand that there are people who are uninsured, and we want to be sure that those who are uninsured and need insurance have an availability to get that. But we're going to do that in the private market. Rather than having the government take over one-sixth of the economy, mm -hmm. we're going to put this into the market and allow the market to work so that, that it will be a patient-doctor relationship and not a government mm. mandate. So what do you replace Obamacare with? I mean, is it a bill? Are you, are you doing we, similar to what you're doing with Medicare, where you're block-granting this? to the states? We do have our own plan, and there's been a plan that has been out there for a number of years. As a matter of fact, even before Obamacare was passed, uh, I wasn't in Congress, but my colleagues did have a solution for a free market solution for helping to cover people that um, mm -hmm. couldn't receive insurance. Uh, as I get into the intricacies of this budget, while Obamacare is cut, the tax revenue from it, a trillion dollars, remains in this budget. So you're counting the trillion dollars in tax revenue, even though the spending for the for Obamacare itself is cut. Is that double yes. dealing here? Well, What's going on? What, what happens, and it is a little bit, I won't get too much in okay, the weeds. Okay, yeah, don't but go too far in the it weeds. It is because of the way the CBO scores and the mm -hmm. base of how they score this. So until you actually change the law, you have to count that in. Uh -huh. But once you change the law, then they can reevaluate what you're doing. So it is um, a difficulty in the way mm -hmm. that we we do our scoring right now. And you still balance in 10 years? That's even, correct. Even losing that trillion that dollars of tax revenue? When you do dynamic scoring, and you show that things, as I say, um, when you redo your tax system and you um, take away some of the regulations and you see our economy pick up, um, the, there are two ways that you can balance a budget. One is more taxes and the other is to grow the economy. Mm -hmm. And our budget grows the economy. And mm -hmm. that's really what's best for people because it puts them back to work, uh, it increases their, their income. And so we have a dynamic scoring on ours where we can actually show that the kinds of things we want to do will get the economy moving and therefore for more tax revenue will come in. I've got to talk to you for a moment about the budget caps that have been in place for yes. some time and seem to be helping the overall economy. Holding down spending on Capitol Hill is always a good thing. The defense budget this time is getting a $20 billion bump in spending, so it's going up. That's yes. blowing the cap. What, why, why are we blowing the spending cap on defense? Well, the Budget Control Act, which was put into place two years ago, um, recognized that we cannot keep on spending uh, more than what we bring in every right. year. And of course, when that was passed, we weren't in a situation where we are with our national defense, where we have so many things that are happening, the Boko Haram, mm -hmm. um, all of the radical Islamic problems that we're having, the ISIS, and so it is a more dangerous country. Mm -hmm. And the military have told us that they cannot protect this nation the way we're asking them to do with so many of these conflicts around the world. Mm -hmm. um, we would put our men and women in peril by not giving them the kinds of services mm -hmm. that they or the kind of equipment that they need. 
So we are then on the um, OCO side or the uh, side that is the war, global war on terrorism. Mm -hmm. We're increasing it on that side, but the base is staying the same. But there's a slush fund on the side well, the, for in the uh, in the overseas uh, contingency, contingency operations, operations fund. fund. That's correct. So that's kind of an extra fund on the side. That's right. That's a lot of money. That's I mean, how do you offset it? Here's the question. How do you offset that increase in spending? Well, again, when you look at what will happen with our budget and the kinds of things that we put into our budget that allow the economy to grow, we can see that that money um, will be picked up in other ways. We mm -hmm. do other reforms. We do Medicare reform, um, mm -hmm. for instance, that then allows us also to bring in some additional dollars and cut some spending. Mm -hmm. So when all of that balances out, um, we really just feel that national defense is is necessary. We must be sure that our men and women, that we're asking them to go into war, have the kinds of equipment that they need. And um, we're, we're going to have to look at the other kinds of things that need to be done with, for instance, our Air Force is the smallest that it's been since the Air Force was developed. Mm. We have the least ships that we have had since World War II. So with all of those decisions that were made during the Budget Control Act, with where we were with the national defense at that time, it has changed. And we have got to make sure that we're doing the things that we need to do because, after all, that is our number one responsibility is to keep people safe. Protecting the homeland. That's yeah. right. Uh, let's talk for a moment about the doctor fix that was passed today. Uh, this would cure the Medicare payments to doctors. A lot of physicians, they're simply not taking Medicare patients. Yes. Uh, tell us what this will alleviate. Even the president is supportive of this. Yes. A number of years ago, the sustainable growth rate was put into place a way to help control spending and what they have found over the years is it did not work. It was a flawed um, plan when they put it into place and 17 times now it has been extended. So our doctors um, just live with uncertainty about what, how they're going to be reimbursed for their services. Mm -hmm. And what this does is it takes that uncertainty away, it puts a new plan in place and allows us to truly see the cost of care by doing this as well. Uh, let's talk for a moment about this new GAO report, uh, Government Accounting Office report. It found that one 1.5 billion dollars was spent over the last three years in state and federal funds by Planned Parenthood. Now when you see that, you think what? Well, I think it only confirms what we've been saying for the last uh, several years. And this report took two years to get to us. Uh, we asked for this report over two years ago. And of course, they've done the research that needed to be done, but they have confirmed what we have been saying. Money is fungible. So let's take Planned Parenthood because they are the biggest provider right. of um, abortions across our entire country. So they get money from Title X, which are taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, well, those dollars are only being used for family planning and other services that they provide. But we know on the other side of the wall is an abortion clinic. So that money is fungible. How can you say an abortion clinic that's in the same building, has the same lights, mm -hmm. it's got mm -hmm. the same rent, the same yeah. heat, and that money is not being used? We know now by this report that it is being used. So what's the solution? You're looking for Title X Title reform, 10, which, is the, right. which is the funding mechanism here. But what does that mean? How? What yes. wall would you like to, yes. to see erected here? It would say that Title X money, which was a originally um, put there for just that that reason is to help people with family planning. There mm -hmm. are some other services that they do in those clinics as well. Mm -hmm. But if you also are a provider of abortion, you will not be entitled to those ten, title to ten dollars. So mm -hmm. that way we can make sure that if you're doing just this, that's what we want you to do is do what it was intended in Title mm -hmm. 10. I want to shift gears for a moment, talk about uh, Resolution 139, that this is a House resolution you're proposing that would do what and why is it necessary now? Yes, it is necessary because, again, we see the violence with the Islamic, radical Islamists all around the world. We want to say to those that are in the Middle East that are being persecuted because of their religion mm -hmm. that we are with them. Not only are we praying, but we're going to take action. And so what we're doing is we're condemning the violence, number one, is to say what is happening is, is absolutely not right, religious persecution. Mm -hmm. um, number two is that we're going to take action. We're asking the president to send an envoy to the Middle East um, to make sure that the human rights are being recognized there. Mm -hmm. um, this was a resolution that was passed back in 2014. Yeah, there was a Near East, uh, it was right. a Near East and South, South Central Asia. That's Act, right. Asking the president to appoint the same special envoy, yes. Congresswoman. 
nothing was done. And he did not. Uh, the State Department said it wasn't needed, and now look at where we are. It obviously is needed, and we're calling upon the president to appoint the and, special And the special envoy. envoy would do what? Well, they would go there, first of all, to say that what is happening is wrong, because that's been recognized in human rights mm -hmm. um, through the UN. Uh, it's been recognized, and they're not mm -hmm. upholding what has been recognized by other nations as well. And they would be appointed to promote religious that's, freedom that's in these right. various countries. That's exactly right. Are, are, do you support attaching our federal aid and, uh, or rather, foreign aid to religious rights and human rights? Yes, and some of that is already done. Kay Granger, who is mm -hmm. on the appropriations, the foreign um, appropriations, she does make those decisions, and money has been withheld. Uh, and, and tying that, and sometimes um, she has said, and I've been there with her when she's told leaders, if you do this, we will not send your foreign aid. And money has been withheld, and it needs to be withheld even in greater um, amounts yeah, when I this mean, is occurring. Isn't it difficult, though, to ask the president of this, when at the same time, we are making deals with Cuba, we're making deals with Iran, we're in business with China. These are religious uh, uh, persecutors extraordinaire, and we're talking about the governments themselves. How do you get from where they are to where you'd like them to be? Well, first of all, um, I, I think the Middle East is a little different than that, than we have radical Islamists mm -hmm. who are um, in such crude ways taking young girls from a school. Um, right now, Pastor Abedini being held there in Iran, mm -hmm. um, away from his family. Um, we see the, the 21 Coptic Christians oh. that were kidnapped and um, beheaded. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is devastating. This is not just keeping religion down in those countries to say, you can only meet in small groups like for instance, you can't meet in China right. in any larger group than, I think, 21 people. Right. Um, this is a different kind of religious persecution that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, unconscionable. And so, yes, I think, again, tying um, money and the foreign aid that we give um, to saying that y you cannot um, do what you're doing in these countries and still receive our money. Congresswoman Black, thank you so much for being here. Hope you'll come back. Well, I certainly will. Thank Thanks you for again. having me, Raymond. When we return, the Benedictines of Mary are at it again. Their producer, Monica Fitzgibbons of De Montfort Music, joins us. Why are these singing cloistered nuns dominating the Billboard classical charts? We'll tell you when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. monastic nuns in rural Missouri, number one is becoming a habit. In 2012, they were discovered almost by chance. One of the most unlikely hit records in memory. Benedictine Sisters. Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles. Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles. Their first album and then a second hit number one on Billboard's Classical Artist of the Year in 2012 and 2013. Welcome back to The World Over Live. That is a bit of the number one CD on Billboard's classical traditional chart, Easter at Ephesus. It's the latest CD from the Benedictines of Mary. The sisters are the only order of nuns ever to have won Billboard's coveted classical traditional artist of the year three years in a row. What is it about these nuns and their music that so attracts so many? To offer some insight, we welcome back to the program Monica Fitzgibbons, co-founder of De Montfort Music and The Nun's producer. Great to see you. Thank you. Now, what is it, what is the ongoing allure that these nuns have to make people go and continually buy their releases? This is the fourth number one bestseller for them. Well, yes, as you say, the story continues to increase. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but it, it's definitely true that people are seeking some quieter moments in their life, mm -hmm. some peaceful moments in their life. Uh, we've had so many different comments now. People are falling asleep to it who can't yeah. sleep. Yeah. People are birthing to it. They're dying to it. Yeah. But most of all, I think that it's just a way for people to find peace because we've lost that in our society. Mm. Tell me about the, the nature of this new recording. This is Easter at Ephesus. They've had Lent at Ephesus. We've had uh, Advent at Ephesus. I'm waiting for, you know, Flag Day at Ephesus. <laughs> but but what, tell, me, tell me what Easter at Ephesus is all about. 
the button? Well, it's definitely at Ephesus. Okay. Uh, and Ephesus is their monastery in, in yes, rural Missouri. Our Ladies Priory at Ephesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and, and the reason why it is at Ephesus is because we record these all at their monastery. Hmm. And, you know, as Mother Cecilia said, they, they can't go out into the world. And so we come into the situation. We try to bring different producers in there to sort of have a different, you know, techie look at how they're going to approach this recording because they all sound a little different. Uh -huh. And um, because of the different producers on each yes, project. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Now, on Easter at Ephesus, we all enjoyed working with Christopher Alder, who's now won 11 Grammys. Mm. He had won nine by the time he was at Angels and Saints, but now he's back at Easter at Ephesus. But he brought in, he wanted to bring somebody in from the UK mm. to help him engineer it. Mm -hmm. And so they, you know, they really got into the whole configuration and how were they going to do it. And they had the sisters stand in different places. And mm. of course, you know, Mother Cecilia has quite a classical background. Mother Cecilia is the prioress. We're going to see her in a moment. Yes. And she has a musical background. Yes. She graduated from the Shepherd School of Music at Rice. She was a top seated French horn player mm. and this was very young in her life and she got the call and of course she entered religious life and uh, the name she got was nothing less than Cecilia. Yeah, the, the patron of music. Uh, I want to share this with the audience. This is a little taste of the life of the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of the Apostles and you'll hear in a bit Mother Cecilia the pri Prioress. Listen. For the simple community of monastic sisters, 45 minutes north of Kansas City. Seclusion and simplicity is more than the life they chose. They believe it is their highest calling. We live a monastic life, that is, we live in a monastery, away, hidden from the world. Um, and the sisters who are here have left everything behind to, to be here. They've left their families, their homes, all of their possessions. Uh, their bank accounts, some have had jobs, everything, in order to uh, follow the call of God, of our Lord. So it is a little more than ironic that the voices of these women who spend their days sowing and tending to crops and farm animals would find their way into the ears and spirits of thousands around the globe. It has touched so many lives. I, as the narrator said there a moment ago, what is it about these nuns, these particular nuns, and the process of recording them? This really is an outgrowth of their, their prayer life. Yes. I mean, it's not just, let's get up and do a, a, a tune. No, this isn't a group that gets together every now and again and mm -hmm. has an idea. This is their life. This is a natural expression of what they're doing anyway. Mm -hmm. And so when we go in, as Kevin always says, Kevin, my mm -hmm. husband, who's the co-founder of DeMontfort with me, um, he, he likes to say that when we go in there, we're documenters. We're just there to document them sounding on their best day how they would sound. Tell me how this whole experience, uh, releasing these CDs, uh, universalizing their music, how has it changed these sisters' lives? Has it brought new vocations to them? Well, I would say yes, because they have, uh, I think when we first started you know, working with them, there were around 20, and now I think they're over 30, and oh. have more people uh, you know, coming and inquiring, so such that they need to expand their monastery. Really? Which is exciting. Wow. And, and they paid off all their debt. I know they were in debt when this whole project started. Yes, they were. When we first met them, they were praying to uh, St. Therese and really asking her to help them. Mother Cecilia had uh, become the new prioress, mm -hmm. and they had put out some of their own, you know, homegrown CDs, but the system for which they were doing it wasn't uh, prosperous, and so we sat down and talked about what the goals were, and uh, it wasn't only the CD revenues, they also, uh, you know, make vestments, right. but then they did attract a lot more donors through the mainstream the media and exposure, mm -hmm. this show, and, you know, and it went all the way to CBS and mm -hmm. NPR and PBS, so there was a great diversity of media exposure, which mm -hmm. was very promising. Now, I'm going to ask a cheeky question. <laughs> this is not a new phenomenon. We have had 
big religious acts that have really broken into that secular market, whether it's the priests or uh, the, the, the monks uh, in Spain who had mm -hmm. the chant albums Silent. several, yeah. uh, almost two decades ago now. Uh, is it a fascination with the habits, the hidden mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. the, the what's going on in there? Is that part of the allure? I think we have to all understand that there's something quite mysterious about this mm -hmm. and be open to that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think that that sort of drew us in. At the same time, we're also talking about, uh, you know, some some kind of old school recording mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So we thought it was interesting to kind of take, you know, the best technology that we could mm -hmm. and really bring that out so that we could then transport people essentially to the monastery. Yeah. And capture this. You discovered these, these sisters. I mean, you, you went to the monastery, uh, you got word of them or got a CD from them and decided to go visit. We did. It was not our intention to go and release for number one chart topping. I mean, if but we it's were, awfully nice when it happens. It is nice. <laughs> we'll take it. I mean, we we know that if we're going to do it, we had to do it right. Yeah. And there was this always sense of duty yeah. to sort of protect their image and likeness, mm -hmm. and to take this seriously because and, and we're protect their monastic life, exactly. which they have. Well, I mean, there are times when you know you really wish they would come out more and do more, yeah. be here instead of little old me, yeah. but in the end, you know, you realize these are the spouses of Christ and you best, you know, be on your best behavior. I came across <laughs> an interesting stat the other day. Forty percent of the top ten Billboard classical releases in 2014 were De Montfort artists. And Aim Higher. Okay, well, those we are, but those are your companies. Yes. <laughs> what is it about your taste that the rest of the industry is missing, apparently. Forty percent of the artists in the top ten is a pretty big number. Um, it is, and it's exciting. I just heard that actually yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I, again, I, I really think that Kevin and I, having been in the industry for as long as we have been, mm -hmm. there's not a genre of music that we haven't touched. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think taking all of that and just putting it aside and saying, let's go on the adventure of being art collectors mm -hmm. has led us to this. And, and there's been this other um, supernatural spiritual component yeah. that is very satisfying to be a part of. Now, there is something intangible when you hear these recordings, uh, whether it's the, the boys' choir in Boston right. or the sisters. Uh, it, it, it communicates something other than melody and rhythm. Yes. It's, there's something much more happening. And perhaps that's what people are reacting to yeah. and, and drawn to. It's that missing element that they don't have in their daily lives. And we just want to bring it to them in the best way possible so that it can compete with all the other titles mm -hmm. that are out there. And beauty is attractive. Beauty is attractive. It speaks to the yeah. heart. So what's next? I know you, you have another Benedictine recording coming, but not nuns. Right. Well, we've had a lot of requests over the years to mm -hmm. release monks. And actually, little known factoid, yeah. uh, we tried to sign these monks first. Uh, we we intended to launch De Montfort Music with these monks, and they're um, the Benedictine monks of Norcia or uh -huh. Norcia, if you're going to be very Italiano. See, there you go. Uh -huh. uh, and they're just incredibly musical. You have a, a you know a prior of this community who's American, mm -hmm. has a music background, went to one of the best music schools in the country, the University of Indiana. Mm. And there's going to be a lot to talk about because they're coming out June second. Wow! It's actually already available on Amazon. Really? <laughs> Boy, you're getting ahead of the game. Well, you know. All right, we'll be watching uh, in the days ahead and looking forward to what you come out with next, Monica Thanks Fitzgibbons. Thank you for being here. Easter at Ephesus by the Benedictines of Mary, Queen. Queen of Apostles is available wherever music is sold, including iTunes and, of course, the EWTN Religious Catalog. For more information, visit DeMontfortMusic.com. When we return, Saddleback Pastor Rick Warren and Georgetown University's Tom Farr are here to discuss their fight for religious freedom when the World Over Live continues. Stay tuned. This music is our life. So I think people hear that and it inspires them, and reminds them there's something more to this life than what I see with my eyes.
now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. My next guests are fierce proponents of religious liberty. They recently participated in a conference on proselytism and development sponsored by Georgetown University. They joined us to discuss the pressure some needy populations feel when faith groups or governments offer aid with strings attached. They also spoke about the importance of religious liberty at home and abroad. Here's our exclusive interview with Tom Farr, the director of the Religious Freedom Project at Georgetown, and Rick Warren, the pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California. Tom, this conference that you and Pastor Warren were a part of, this was a proselytization and development conference, really exploring the tension between those, those issues. Tell me, where did this originate and the genesis of this? I know this is a partnership it between is. Georgetown and Baylor. Well, the Religious Freedom Project is a partnership of Georgetown and Baylor, and of course, we we focus on religious freedom. This is our, this we, we say we're building knowledge about religious freedom, and I feel a little guilty putting it that way because this is the first freedom of the American Constitution. The American, so why do why should we have to build knowledge about it? And that's part of the problem. So the way we do this is pick subjects that are involved in religious freedom. Mm -hmm. And from my point of view, proselytism, although it sounds like a bad word to a lot of people, witnessing, which yeah. is pastor's, uh, Pastor Rick's work, yeah. um, is part of religious freedom. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. wanted to bring together people who are skeptics, and we mm -hmm. did. Yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. And Got a wide section. Uh, they, their point of view is that, you know, witnessing or proselytization is too aggressive. It takes advantage of people. Mm -hmm. it, it coerces mm -hmm. people. It's a result of power imbalances. So we really had a good discussion of this. Mm -hmm. But frankly, Raymond, I'm going to give you a trade secret here. Mm -hmm. As long as I have people like this guy next to me arguing for religious freedom, I'm per perfectly prepared to have the best that the other side <laughs> can provide. Pastor Rick, uh, you and your church, Saddleback, is involved in so much development around the globe. Yeah. Uh, I know particularly in Africa, yeah. you were telling me last time we met about your peace program. Do you encounter charges of proselytization? Is that a concern when you go into these well, yeah. countries or uh, communities? In the first place, I think it was important that Tom started the conference by talking about the history mm -hmm. of development. And I thought that was good because for 2,000 years, the only history of development is the church. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that the church has been doing relief, aid, development, education, health care, 2,000 years longer than any government and uh, 2,000 years longer than any NGO. So the audacity of telling the church, we're going to tell you how to do it, is, is really nonsense. And then to add the skepticism of, well, maybe you have a mixed motivation. Mm -hmm. Well, the point that I wanted to make is first, Compassion should never have any strings attached to it. Mm -hmm. You just show compassion. We do it mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus, but we do it with no mm -hmm. strings attached. Mm -hmm. It's not a quid pro quo, you have to convert because we've given you this help. This is not at all. We don't even, there is no coercion conversion. Hmm. Conversion is my own decision. If I don't have a freedom to, to be a disbeliever, then I, how can I be a believer? Mm -hmm. I have to have that choice. God gives me the choice, so we give it to others. But we do it out of love. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. We, and, and the Bible says, I'm commanded to love, and we're commanded. So I do this in obedience. And everybody has a motive for um, good works. They're not always my motive. Some businesses do good things for a profit motive. Sure. That's not my motive, but I'm not against it. Mm -hmm. The government does good works for national security reasons, mm -hmm. to build friendships. That's not my motive, but I'm not against it. So don't question our motives when we do it in love in the name of Christ, when I'm not saying, you have to do it my way, don't force me to do it your way to put my motivation. While mm -hmm. compassion should be without strings, it is not without motivation. Mm -hmm. And our motivation is love. It isn't, isn't part of this though, the Christian impulse to charity, to helping your fellow man, isn't that really about changing the culture and the hearts of those in the community? Isn't that really at the, at the center of that effort? You know, if I'm a doctor and somebody comes to me and say, I, I'm bleeding and I need a Band-Aid, well, I can put a Band-Aid on that. But if I discover they have cancer too, it's unethical for me to just send them away with a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. And yes, people need food and people need training and people need care and all of the things that we do in development. But our deepest needs are in our soul, in our spirit. 
And so I cannot in good conscience and in good ethics only care about the body and then walk away if they're dying of cancer spiritually. Hmm. Tom Farr, uh, Pope Francis recently said just a few weeks ago, we need to reject proselytization and com competition in all its forms. Mm. What do you think he meant by that? I think he was not talking about bringing people to Jesus Christ. Right. Not evangelization. Yeah, no. he, he could not possibly no. have been talking no. about that. He may well have been talking about intra-Christian uh, competition. Mm -hmm. You know, he had gone and spoken to the Pentecostals right. down in southern Italy. He's very, very uh, aware of the, the, the sheep stealing right. competition, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is probably a case to be made as destructive. We don't believe in coercion, but we do believe in persuasion. Mm -hmm. And I believe that everybody, uh, everybody persuades. In one sense, the word proselytize is only used in a negative term for Christians. But actually, everybody proselytizes. Parents proselytize their children. They're mm -hmm. trying to change their mind. Teachers proselytize students. They're mm -hmm. trying to change their mind. Environmentalists are constantly trying to proselytize me. Mm -hmm. LGBT are constantly mm -hmm. trying to proselytize me. Both liberal and conservative political parties are trying to proselytize me. So everybody is in the business of persuasion. So why is it that only Christians can't do it? Mm. It should be in a free market society, may the best idea win. And this is why we believe in religious liberty. Mm -hmm. We believe in liberty for views that we totally disagree with yeah. because it protects our right. That's right. There, there is a challenge here, I think, for the whole faith-based community in that I know both of you are proponents of and probably some of the greatest spokesmen for religious freedom. Mm. What happens when you encounter, though, certain strains of, as an example, Islam, mm. and when it comes into a country and it imposes a single religion to the exclusion of all others? Their version of religious freedom is you no longer get to practice. How do you deal with that? Well, that's not religious freedom. Religious freedom the antithesis of it is a, of a complete monopoly by one group, one religious group that right. has, and this is a lesson, frankly, of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. Raymond. When one religious group has exclusive access to the police and civil powers of the state, it's bad for the society and it's bad for the religion. Mm -hmm. So religious freedom cannot mean that the, the Muslims or anybody else have a complete control over a society. Pluralism is another good word for this. It means everybody gets a voice on the basis of equality. That includes religious and non-religious mm -hmm. uh, voices and actors. One of the things that Tom wanted to point out in this conference, and also Tim Shaw, who was a co-director in this conference, mm -hmm. is that unless I have the freedom to convert, I don't have true religious freedom. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, I have been in certain Muslim countries where they'll say, oh, we have freedom of religion, which means if you're born, a Christian, you can stay a Christian. You right. can practice, if you're born a Jew, you can stay a Jew and practice a Jew. Yeah. You may not change religions, and certainly uh, a Muslim may not become some other religion. Right. Then it's not true religion, true freedom, unless I have a freedom to change my mind. But Pastor Warren, Pew recently did a study, and it demonstrated that Christians are the most harassed group globally. 52% of the country surveyed, there were harassment either by the government or one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. harassment. What do you say to those Christians in these countries, in these territories, that feel so alone mm -hmm. and harassed because you have an opportunity to say yes. something to them now? Well, in the first place, I would say we're praying for you. And we do need to pray for the persecuted. The Bible says to remember those in chains. Mm -hmm. We're to pray for those in prison. Uh, Jesus said the last Beatitudes is, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. That's about as much of an endorsement as you can get. Jesus saying there will be reward in heaven. It's been done to people in the past. You should be proud of the fact that you mm -hmm. have stood for my name. Jesus said be well, beware when all men speak well of you. I'm not worried about Christians under persecution as I'm worried about Christians where their faith is no challenge at all. Hmm. I actually find that the greatest witness is when our faith is tested 
Um, it could be uh, a loss, like the loss of my son and how mm -hmm. I perform, how I act publicly mm -hmm. on that loss. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, the loss of a job. People will take your faith seriously when it costs you something. And the problem is often in America, it doesn't cost us anything. Right. And so people don't take our faith seriously. Mm. But we pray for them, we love them, and we know that one day, great is your reward in heaven. Hmm. Tom Farr, uh, we're looking at this terrible situation in Syria, in Iraq. Ugh, this entire region, Christians are literally being expelled and slaughtered in huge numbers, basically by this ISIS organization. What would be your recommendation if you were brought into the Congress or the White House today, you would tell them to do what? Uh, I fear it would have to be the, well, I'm not running for president, but <laughs> I, I think it's the White House that has to take this action. Congress can pass laws, but Congress passed 16 years ago the International Religious Freedom Act, mm -hmm. which has basically been ignored, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, mm -hmm. by three administrations, but especially this one. Mm -hmm. We do have a new ambassador, Rick and I both know him, and uh, his name is David Saperstein. Sure. We think he's a good man, but he's only got a couple of years left, and mm -hmm. he's got six years of, behind him of not much having been done. Mm -hmm. So I do think that we have to, Rick was talking about how you have different motivations for doing things. Mm -hmm. For Christians, we want to stand with our brothers and sisters. We want to pray for them. I think of those Christian, 22 Egyptian Christians who were slaughtered on the shores of the Mediterranean. Many of them, I understand, with the name of Jesus on their lips yeah. mm -hmm. as they died. Right. We have got to be motivated by this. This is a national security issue for the United States. Mm -hmm. It is not a Christian motivation per se. But if we do not stop this, and here I'm not speaking of military power, although I personally support the use of military against ISIS. I'm talking about removing the conditions under which groups like ISIS emerge. Mm -hmm. ISIS is an outcropping, the currently the most virulent and dangerous outcropping of a worldwide phenomenon of Islamist, violent Islamist extremism. Mm -hmm. It's not the majority of Muslims, most Muslims reject this. But it has enough plausibility that it, it is a danger not only to the people and the Christians in the region, mm -hmm. but also to the United States. This ought to give us the motivation to integrate this into our foreign policy in such a way that we can make arguments to those societies, you have to get rid of this. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, it's going to harm you and your children and ultimately ours as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I tweeted the other day, ISIS is evil. Mm -hmm. ISIS is evil. You don't negotiate with evil. Mm -hmm. You don't ignore evil. Good people stop evil. Yeah. And the old Edmund Burke phrase, the only thing for evil to triumph is good people to do, do nothing. nothing. Nazism had to be stopped. Mm -hmm. ISIS has to be stopped because it's torturing, it's raping, it's beheading, it's killing. Good people somehow have to stop that. I'm not in the position to determine how that's done, but it has to be stopped. Yeah. Oh, I, I want to move ahead a little bit. In June, the Supreme Court is going to rule one way or another on same-sex marriage and whether that will be a legal right nationally. Do you see, assuming that that goes in the positive and that they rule that this is a national right, mm -hmm. do you see churches caught in the crosshairs and perhaps being asked to accept or bless these unions in conflict with what they might be teaching? All I know is what Peter said to the Sanhedrin, we must obey God rather than men. I remember one time on a CNN interview with uh, Piers Morgan and he asked me quite clearly, Rick, do you ever think you're gonna change your mind on the definition of marriage and what the meaning of marriage is? And I said, no, I don't ever see myself doing that. And I said, the reason why is because I fear God's disapproval more than I fear yours or society. And this is again where we must be, have the daring faith to stand alone. Who said that Christianity or what is holy and what is godly is always gonna be popular? Mm -hmm. And so we, we must live in whatever culture, and I would say this, for 2,000 years, the church has survived every crumbling culture. 
No culture has lasted. Where's the Assyrian Empire? Where's the Roman Empire? No culture lasts, and even the American Empire will not last forever, we know that. But we do know that the church is gonna last forever because it's the one thing God created to last forever. Mm. Tom Farr, you ran from 1999 to 2003 the International Religious Freedom Office for the State Department. They recently appointed, the State Department did, a, an ambassador for human rights for the LGBT community. You have concerns about that position vis-a-vis -vis religious freedom. What are they? Well, first of all, um, I don't think any of us would object, and certainly I wouldn't, to the idea that we should protect human beings, whatever their identity is, sure. from violence. Right, absolutely. And if people are being... Equal dignity, equal protection. Absolutely. And, and homosexuals are treated brutally in yes. the Muslim majority they world. Are. And we should stand against that mm -hmm. in our human rights policy. But what I fear is that this is intended to go far beyond uh, protecting people against violence and unjust discrimination. It's intended, I believe, to go further and to promote the, the gay rights agenda in a much broader sense, driving faith-based institutions out of public life by saying if you don't accept this, then you're no longer welcome in the public square. I think this is what is happening in the United States. Mm -hmm. I think if this is the agenda of this administration. This has been going on, Raymond, behind the scenes since the Obama administration took office. It, uh, it happened under Secretary Clinton. There was simply no, um, there was no special envoy. It mm -hmm. was uh, behind the scenes. Now the religious liberty connection is that, you know, we still disagree over this issue of gay rights in our country, even if we do have the expected decision. This is an unsettled right, if that's what it is, and what it means, what the content of it means. Mm -hmm. None of us disagrees about the violence and the, we, we all accept the equal dignity. Mm -hmm. But religious freedom, there's no, there, this is the first freedom of American history. And we have a law that requires us to promote it. This administration has not been promoting religious liberty, but it has been promoting its gay rights agenda internationally. Tom keeps mentioning that religious liberty is what we call the first freedom of America. And the reason why, it's the one freedom that makes our nation unique from every other nation, because it was founded on that. The, the right to worship, to practice, and to propagate is the first phrase of the first sentence, of the first paragraph, of the first amendment. Freedom of religion comes before freedom of speech. It comes before freedom of the press. It comes before the right to assemble. It comes before the right to bear arms. Why? Because if I don't have the freedom to believe and practice my beliefs, I don't need freedom of speech. If I don't have the freedom to believe and practice what I believe, I don't need the freedom of assembly. I don't need freedom of the press. Every other freedom comes out of this freedom of conscience. And what we have today is, uh, because of political correctness and everything, wanting to clamp down and say, no, you can't say that because we disagree with you. Now, there are two myths in, a, in our society today. One of them is that if you love someone, you must agree with everything they believe. That's, a, that's nonsense. I love my wife and she agrees with a lot of things, disagrees with a lot of things <laughs> that I do. And, and yet she still loves me and she, and so love does not mean you agree on everything. I can love people I totally disagree with, that's nonsense. And the other one is that if you disagree with somebody, then you're afraid of them, you're phobic. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of anybody. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I have no phobia, I'm not afraid. And it's, and it's not hate speech if you simply disagree with somebody. Mm -hmm. You must be respectful. And even the Bible says this. It says be, in 1 Peter, be willing to share the hope that was in, within you, uh, but do it with gentleness and respect. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. You can also sign up for my e-blast. I'll send you exclusive news you won't find anywhere else and links to all the show's segments. Don't miss next week, an exclusive behind-the-scenes preview of Mark Burnett's biblical epic, A.D. The Bible continues. It premieres this Easter on NBC and you get the first look. We'll also examine the Shroud of Turin in a special report. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over. 
for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.